Hello, everyone. This is the 73rd episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles, and I am joined by Paul from Shipland, England. For this episode, we continue our interview series with Mr. Gavin Buckland and Mr. Steve Pye as we discuss the English league season, continuing with the 1982-83 season. Mr. Buckland is Everton's official statistician, question of sports script consultant, Radio Merseyside regular, and the Liverpool Echo Royal Blue podcaster. Mr. Pye is a blogger. His blog is that 1980s sports blog and a contributor to Guardian Sport Network and The Gooner. Welcome to both of you. Hi. Hi, pleasure to be on. Is that right? On our last discussion for the 1981-82 for English Football League season, Liverpool became champions in a season that they had started in poor fashion, but were unstoppable after Boxing Day, while Tottenham won the FA Cup for the second year running. Liverpool were the dominant side of the day, and that was set to continue for the foreseeable future. Just like last time in presenting this new season of 1982-83, before discussing the actual season, we will quickly go through each team and describe their main transfer activity along with the names of the better known players. Once again, I won't go through every single player transfer activity, but just the significant ones with better known players. Nor will I read through the full team rosters, but just the familiar names so that everyone will have a general idea on the teams and players on display. In addition, uh, since this is England, there will be transfers during the season. And as we go through our discussion, the significant transfers during the season will also be discussed. Let's start alphabetically with Arsenal, managed by Terry Neal. They had acquired Lee Chapman from Stoke and Tony Woodcock from Köln. Players on the team included Pat Jennings and George Woodingall, John Devine, David O'Leary, Kenny Sansom, John Hollins, Paul Davis, Graham Ricks, Stuart Robson, Brian Talbot, Alan Sunderland, Raphael Mead, and Paul Vassen, in addition to Chapman and Woodcock. European champions Aston Villa, managed by Tony Barton. They acquired Alan Kerbishley from Birmingham. And Gary Shelton had left to join Sheffield Wednesday. The players included Jimmy Rimmer and Nigel Spink in goal, Eamon DC, Alan Evans, Kenny Swain, Colin Gibson, Ken McNaught, Gary Williams, Des Bremner, Gordon Cowens, Dennis Mortimer, Mark Walters, Tony Morley, Gary Shaw, and Peter Witt. Birmingham City managed by Ron Saunders. They had acquired Scottish goalkeeper Jim Blith from Coventry. The departures included Colin Todd to Nottingham Forest, Alan Kerbishley to Aston Villa, and Dutchman Bud Broken to Groningen. So you still had Tony Cotton in goal, Mark Dennis, David Langan, Welshman Byron Stevenson, Pat Vanden Howe, and Mick Harford. Brighton, managed by Michael Bailey. Their departures included the Israeli Jacob Cohn to Beitar Tel Aviv and Mickey Thomas to Stoke. So the team included the likes of Steve Foster, Sammy Nelson, Gary Andrew Stevens, Jimmy Case, Tony Grealish, Gary Howlett, Mike Robinson, Jerry Ryan, and Andy Ritchie among others. Coventry managed by Dave Sexton. Jim Blith had left to join Birmingham and Dutchman Ruth Kaiser had joined French side Nice. You still had Les Silly, Ian Butterworth, Danny Thomas, Gary Thompson, Jerry Daly, Gary Gillespie, Mark Haitley, Jerry Francis, Steve Witten and Steve Hunt, who had returned from loan from Cosmos, New York Cosmos, in September. Now we come to Everton, managed by Howard Kendall. 
They had acquired Derek Mountfield from Tranmere Rovers. Andy King had returned from West Bromwich Albion. And Kevin Sheedy and David Johnson, the duo arrived from Liverpool. As far as the departures, Mick Lyons had left to join Sheffield Wednesday. So you had Neville Southall in goal, John Bailey, Brian Burrows, Derek Mountfield, Gary Michael Stevens, Kevin Ratcliffe, Alan Ainsco, Steve McMahon, Andy King, Adrian Heath, Kevin Richardson, Graham Sharp, and the Irishman Mike Walsh. So now we come to Ipswich. They had a new manager as Bobby Robson had been appointed as a New England national team manager. So the new manager was Bobby Ferguson. And the other significant arrival was David Barnes from Coventry. As far as the departures, Kevin Beatty had left to join Colchester United. Beatty had effectively retired in December of 1981. In the summer of 1982, Ken Brown, the manager of Norwich, offered him a short-term contract. However, Ipswich refused his release to a rival, and instead he had joined Colchester United. So Ipswich still had the likes of Paul Cooper, George Burley, Terry Butcher, Mick Mills, Russell Osman, Trevor Putney, Franz Tyson, John Wark, Eric Gates, Paul Mariner, Kevin O'Callaghan, and Alan Brazil. Now we come to defending champions Liverpool, managed by Bob Paisley. David Fairclough had returned from his loan at Toronto Blizzard, and we mentioned that Kevin Sheedy and David Johnson had joined Everton. Also, Howard Gale was loaned to Newcastle. But the star-studded team still contained the likes of Bruce Groblar, Alan Hansen, Alan Kennedy, Mark Lawrenson, Phil Neal, Phil Thompson, Steve Nicole, Craig Johnson, Sammy Lee, Graham Souness, Terry McDermott, though he would live in September, Ronnie Willen, Kenny Daglish, Ian Rush, who would have an excellent season that year, and David Hodgson. Now we come to a newly promoted side, Luton, managed by David Pleat. The main arrival was Paul Walsh from Charlton. The other players in the team included the Yugoslav Radomir Antic, Mal Donicky, Mitchell Thomas, Ricky Hill, Brian Horton, Brian Steen, and Mark Azelwood. Manchester City, managed by John Bond. They had lost Trevor Francis to Sampdoria in Italy, while the Scotsman Tommy Hutchinson had joined Bulova. The team included Joe Corrigan in goal, Paul Power, the Norwegian Adj Harade, Tommy Caton, Asa Hartford, Phil Boyer, Dennis Stewart, and Kevin Reeves. Now we come to Manchester United, managed by Ron Atkinson. The arrivals included the Dutchman Arnold Muren of Ipswich, Paul McGrath of St. Patrick's Athletic. The the departures included Gary Bertels, who would leave in September, as Norman Whiteside had come to prominence. You have Gary Bailey in goal, Arthur Albiston, Martin Buchan, Mike Doxbury, John Gidman, Gordon McQueen, Kevin Moran, Steve Copel. Ashley Grimes, Lou Macari, Remy Moses, Brian Robson, Ray Wilkins, Alan Davies, Norman Whiteside, Frank Stapleton. Now we come to the next promoted side, Norwich City, managed by Ken Brown. Martin O'Neill had arrived from Manchester City. We have to mention, they had included on their books the New Zealand striker, Vinton Roofer but he couldn't get a work permit. So he never made an appearance for the side. And before the season, he joined a suicide uh, FC Zurich. And eventually he would make his way to Werder Bremen later in the decade and into the next. It's one of those, what if, what if had he stayed? The team included the likes of Chris Woods, Dave Watson, Mark Barham, John Dean. 
and Willie Donnerkey. Now we come to Nottingham Forest, managed by Brian Clough. The arrivals included Colin Todd from Birmingham, and the departures included Peter Shilton, who joined Southampton, Justin Fashanu was loaned in August to Southampton as well. John McGovern joined Bolton. Jurgen Rober joined Bayer Leverkusen. The team included the Norwegian Einar Az, Viv Anderson, Chris Fairclough, Willie Young, Steve Hodge, Ian Boyer, John Robertson, Ian Wallace, Peter Davenport, amongst others. Now we come to Nuts County, managed by Howard Wilkinson. Howard Wilkinson was the new manager as James Sorrell had stepped down that also lost Don Masson. So the team included the likes of Brian Kilkline, Nigel Worthington, John Chidozi, the Algerian Rashid Harkouk, the Finnish Aki Lahtinen, now we come to Southampton, managed by Laurie McMenemy. Peter Shilton had joined from Nottingham Forest, as well as we mentioned Justin Fashanu on loan from Nottingham Forest. Mark Wright arrived from Oxford as well. The significant departures include obviously Kevin Keegan, who had joined Newcastle. The team included Peter Shilton, Steve Baker. Ivan Golak, Chris Nicole, David Armstrong, Steve Morin, Alan Ball, Steve Williams, and Mick Shannon. Stoke City, managed by Richie Barker. The new arrivals included the brothers Mark and Neville Chamberlain from Portwell. Mickey Thomas had arrived from Brighton. The, the departures included Alan Bailey to Portsmouth. Lee Chapman to Arsenal. The team included the Welshman George Berry, Steve Bold, Brandon O'Callaghan, Paul Bracewell, Day Watson, Mickey Thomas, Sammy McElroy, the Dutchman Loke Ursum, and the Chamberlain brothers. Now we come to Sunderland, managed by Alan Durbin. The arrivals included Ian Atkins of Shrewsbury. The players on the rosters included Chris Turner, Ian Monroe, Barry Venison, Ian Atkins, Alan McCoist, Colin West, Jimmy Nicole. So now we come to, to Swansea, managed by player manager John Toshak. You had Day Davies in goal, Leighton James, Nigel Stevenson, Ray Kennedy. John Mahoney, Robbie James, Chris Marustic, Colin Pascoe, Jeremy Charles, Alan Curtis, and Bob Latchford. Now we come to Tottenham, managed by Keith Birkinshaw. Gary Mabbott had joined from Bristol Rivers. And in this early part of the season, the Argentine Ozzy Ardiles had been loaned to Paris Saint-Germain because of the Falklands War, though he would return in the second half of the season. The team included Ray Clements, Tony Parks, Mark Bowen, Chris Hutton, Paul Miller, Graham Roberts, Paul Price, Tony Galvin, Mickey Hazard, Glenn Hoddle, Steve Perriman, Ricky Villa, Steve Archibald, Garth Crooks, and Mark Falco. Now we come to West Bromwich Albion with new manager Ron Viley, who had replaced Ronnie Allen. And we mentioned that Andy King had also left to join Everton. So you have the likes of Derek Statham, Martin Yole, Gary Owen, Romeo Zondervan, Cyril Regis, among others. Now we come to West Ham, managed by John Lyle. The team included the likes of Phil Parks, Frank Lampard Sr., Alvin Martin, Ray Stewart, Paul Allen, Billy Bonds, Trevor Brooking, Alan Devonshire, Paul Godard, the Belgian Francois van der Elst, and Tony Cutty. Finally, we come to the last 
promoted team of the season and the surprise package of the season. Watford managed by Graham Taylor. They included the likes of Neil Price, Pat Rice, John Barnes, Nigel Callahan, Kenny Jacket, Jerry Armstrong, Luther Brissett, Mo Johnson, and Wilf Roston. So let's start off with a charity shield. On August 21st, Liverpool defeated Tottenham with Ian Rush scoring the winner to kick off the season. Just a few days later, on August 26th, Bob Paisley announced that this would be his last season as Liverpool manager. It was his ninth season in charge. Paisley, there's an interesting story there, isn't there, that? He told them the previous the, the start of the previous season that that was going to be his last season, and I think there was a conversation then between the Liverpool board and John Toshak that they told John Toshak that he was going to be taken over as manager, and I think Toshak thought he was going to have the job from the start of the eighty two eighty three season, and then I think Paisley sort of went back on his promise, and I think to maybe talk about Swansea season, but I'm sure Swansea, some of Swansea's decline was the fact that I think Tosh was a bit, oh. a bit put out by that and a bit affected by that. Bit of an interesting motif, um, Gavin, if, if Tosh had gone to... Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. I mean, Tosh, I mean, he obviously had that thing the previous season, hadn't he, where he bought his Liverpool shirt and <laughs> yeah. then he had a minute of silence for, for Bill Shankly's... Uh, Sad passing. Yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, I would have yeah. worked out because I'm just thinking you had Fagan for the year, Daglish. It would have been an unusual appointment, wouldn't he? Even an outside, yeah. I know he's been a player. He was an outsider coming in. Yeah. And it would have been the first appointment like that since Shankly, 20 odd years before. And yeah, it's interesting by the Tosh style of play would have fitted in with Liverpool, but he was in the in it. Top class team, as Shahan alluded to, that they were the dominant force at the time. Yeah, and he may not have gone to Spain or Portugal. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's just an incest and what, what if, as Steve says. We come to the month of September, and already we have some transfers. The Dutchman, Tuan van Mierlo, he leaves Birmingham to join Willem Tue. Terry McDermott leaves Liverpool to join Kevin Keegan at Newcastle. One of the strange transfers, Peter Beardsley from Vancouver Whitecaps, joins Manchester United, but will hardly get a look in the entire season. I think he only plays one game, didn't he? But was it one I game believe so, yeah. Played? yeah. Beardsley, the only player to play for both clubs in Manchester and both clubs in Liverpool, isn't he? Oh, is he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's the only player to do. Well, because he, ended up, he ended up yeah. at Manchester City in 97, 98, would you believe? Which is just, yeah, that's uh, the team. I, I couldn't remember him playing for Man City. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I yeah. It's just wow. hard, isn't it? Right? I right don't remember that. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think the other thing, as a follow-up, for, it took a couple of years to, to sort of go through the system. After Willie Young took out Paul Allen in the 1980 <laughs> FA Cup final and disgracefully only got a book in, Two years later, they, they brought, you know, as the FA and sort of the Football League and their, their wisdom changed the rules of the game, they, they ruled that all denying of a goal scoring opportunity offences would be a red card. So at the start of the season, there was a, a slew of red cards. It's an unbelievable number. I mean, I was a, I mean, I was a goal to someone game. It was two, two in one game for um, denying goal scoring opportunities. And if you have a look at the stats, it was an unbelievable number of red cards given out at the start of this campaign. As a as a consequence, so I don't I don't even think did they have red cards then, or was it that they'd been scrapped? It was one of the yeah. things. Yeah, and it was just a, that was the big change in the summer of the rules, wasn't it? The application of the rules, which they normally do one a season, was the denying of a goal scoring opportunity as a, a red card, all thanks to uh, Willie Young, who I'm sure uh, Steve um... holds in a lot of respect. Yeah, I, I think he did the right thing with the young. Um, <laughs> <laughs> was Glenn Keeley 82 83, or was it that the pre? That was that 82 83? Yeah, yeah, yeah Glenn Keeley, yeah, in the Derby, the Derby at uh, Goldison. Glenn is, is only. 
Yeah. The only game for Everton he was sent off after 30 minutes. And he later he later said that he'd not played, he'd not played for like eight months. And at least he said he later said because he'd not played or been around, he did he wasn't aware of the rule change. You know, that, <laughs> that was the, that was his excuse anyway. But yeah. it was yeah, yeah, it was it was one of one of them, but yeah, it was it was an enormous number of red cards at the start of the season for so stuff that had not been red carded before. Other transfers in September included Dutch goalkeeper Hans van Broeklen joining Nottingham Forest from Utrecht. Gary Bertels rejoined Nottingham Forest from Manchester United. Yeah, he never succeeded at United. And with the emergence of Whiteside, he knew the opportunities would be more limited for him. Also, Mick Shannon left Southampton to join Newcastle. Some stories during this month of September, Manchester City had offered Martin Peters, who was 38 year old, to play, but nothing came out of that. Laurie McManamy offered Alan Simonson, the Danish star, to come on loan from Barcelona to replace Keegan. Obviously, we know that Simonson would eventually join Charlton Athletic in second division. In another story, Graham Taylor was furious that Kenny Jackett's fiance bore her bare bottom in a tabloid and, according to Taylor, damaged the club's image. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. yeah. I can't be sure. I've never heard that story. No, I've never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> The only, the only time we definitely mentioned something like that on this podcast was when we saw we saw like Sammy Nelson doing the last <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, You know, France yeah. football, the excellent France football magazine had these headlines, and uh, I was able to pick up some of these from there. On September 3rd, Manchester City defeated Watford 1 0. In the third minute of this match, Joe Corrigan dislocated his shoulder as he collided with Nigel Callahan. Bobby McDonald winning goal for him for the rest of the match. As a result of the dislocated shoulder, there was some rumors that Pat Jennings might join them on loan. Yeah. But uh, yeah, nothing came out of that. By match day five, Watford go on top along with Manchester United and Manchester City. Around the same time, Manchester United is linked with a Swedish goalkeeper, Jan Muller, who was at Toronto as a cover for yeah. Bailey, but that also nothing materialized from that. There are persistent rumors that Ron Atkinson said he had been thinking of, about Alan Brazil, but felt that Whiteside is doing the job and has potential. More about Alan Brazil later on. Yeah. Towards the middle of September, Manchester United go on top. But by the end of the month, Liverpool go on top. There's a significant result late September where Watford defeats Sunderland 8-0 with Blissett scoring four goals in that match. Yeah, that, that, that was, was a that, that was a crazy yeah. weekend. That was yeah, I, I, I did write a blog about that, but I've had to write down the numbers. But there there were a hundred and 51 football league goals that weekend and there were six hat-tricks scored including Jim Melrose for commentary against Everton sorry sorry Gavin but thanks what it was Steve that was one of his two career hat-tricks and both yeah, of them against yeah. Everton would you believe yeah. <laughs> that's that's bad luck and then um yeah there were Kerry Dixon scored four goals in a game for, for Reading, but lost 7-5 against Doncaster in, in that same weekend as well. So Yeah, and, 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 and I think Ian, Ian Snow scored a hat for Doncaster in the same game. They had the fight yeah. over the match, but... Yeah, yeah, that, that, was, yeah. that was the... That was, but it wasn't... It was the first division is where all, all the action was. It was the 8-0. Yeah. We got be 4-2. But there was... Wasn't there a few 4-1s and stuff? I think there was 55 goals scored in eight yeah, matches or yeah. something. Yeah. Absolutely crazy. Ipswich, I think Liverpool Ipswich defeated Southampton, I think. Yeah. The 5-0, that, that yeah. same thing, I think. Yeah. Ipswich beat West Brom 6-0 and Stoke drew 4-0 with Luton. Yeah, and as Shahan said, Liverpool won 5-0. So, 
So yeah, yeah I've got Arsenal, sure. Arsenal, Arsenal drew nil nil there that day. So yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I suspect you could have had a whole pod on the yeah. weekend of the 25th of September. Know, bad, yeah. Because I, I remember it very well. I mean, some of it he said was because of the no, because of the new the new rule and that, yeah. that defenders were a little bit more wary about challenging if they were the last if they were the last defender and there was a little bit of uncertainty at the back as they adapted to the new rule. But I remember that day very well. I mean, Watford, I think it's probably really worth talking about Watford, isn't it? Yeah. Because they come up, hadn't they? And we all know Graham Taylor's style of football. And, you know, we know what he's about and what Watford they're about. But they had an incredible, you know, start to the season. As you say, beating Sunderland 8-0. And I think, to be fair, just trying to think now, I can't remember a team coming up with that sort of just well-known for that style of, you know, long ball, getting into the corners and... They took a lot of clubs by surprise, I think, when they came up Watford. I guess a bit later on in the 80s, Wimbledon sort of had a similar style, didn't they? But so, and I think they finished sixth or seventh maybe in their first season. But, uh, but yeah, like you say, it took a lot of teams by surprise, I think. But. Yeah, I mean, Sheffield Wednesday. I mean, but saying that, they had, they had, I mean, they had, I mean, it wasn't as if all kicking rush. They had John Barnes no. on one side and Nigel Callahan on the other, didn't yeah. they? So they had a little yeah. bit of craft and a little bit of... I know John, John Barnes was a, a youngish lad then. He'd probably be, what, 19 and an 82, something like that. But they just had an incredible, incredible season, Watford. And they never yeah. really... So you get promoted teams who come up and then they're good for three months and then they, they slide down the league. But Watford stayed right near yeah. the top, didn't they, for the entire... Entire season, really, and yeah. they, had a, they had a great, great campaign. Though I wouldn't have fancied, fancy playing them. To be honest <laughs> with you, they were tough, tough to face, were they? Yes. Yeah. Now we come to the month of October, and the transfers included Kenny Swain joining Nottingham Forest from Aston Villa, John Holly leaving Arsenal to join Leighton Orient, Peter Ward leaving Nottingham Forest and joining Brighton. Steve Bold from Stoke City. He was loaned to Torque United, though he would return in December. Mike Walsh left Everton to join Norwich. Tottenham's Mark Falco was loaned to Chelsea, although he would return in the new year. And Alan Ball left Southampton to join Eastern Athletic, a Hong Kong club. Steve Bold, I didn't realise he was at Torquay. Yeah, it's on loan, Steve wasn't it? I think. Yeah. 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 Ex- yeah. Extraordinary. I mean, that back four had some really, <laughs> yeah. you know, unlikely origins, didn't he? What was it? Lee Dixon started the Chester, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. But obviously, Lee Dixon and Bold obviously both came from Stoke in the end. Um, right. so- yeah. There's a there's a good bit in the there's a film about Arsenal winning the league in '89 and. Um, George Graham said he used to collect all the local newspapers of places like Stoke and Coventry and to try and get the match reports and try and find out who the best players were. And um, So it's quite interesting. He kind of trawled through the lower leagues and picked up bargains like Dixon and Bold. Yeah. That, that, that's like the, the internet early AC style, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the, the early 80s version of the internet and YouTube, yeah. isn't it? That and yeah. uh, White Scouts and all that type of stuff. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. The, the other the other transfer that's worth saying there uh, is Alan Ball um, leaving. Yeah. Southampton. Alan, yeah. Alan Ball left Southampton to join Hong Kong club Eastern Athletic. His last top flight game was against Everton. Obviously, he'd won the title with Everton uh, twelve years before, and his last the last game for Southampton was against Everton, and, and he missed the penalty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he wasn't the best penalty taker, (laughs) to be fair. In the month of October, Liverpool and Manchester United are near the top. There are some stories that Bob Paisley appealed to his colleagues that there should be two substitutes instead of one. We have to remind everyone that around this time, I guess you're only allowed to make one substitution in league matches. There's a news that Laurie McMenemy refused an offer from 
the NASL from Tampa Bay is saying that he could not desert his club in such difficulty. There's another story of Willie Young. In October, he was suspended for two matches after he was sent off in a friendly in Spain in August. He said, I'm wondering what were the English and Spanish federations doing all this time? <laughs> we also have the Danish star, Alan Simonson, surprisingly joining second division Charlton from Barcelona. We have to remember that Maradona had joined Barcelona and at the time there was still the two foreigner limit. So you had Maradona and Bern Schuster. So Alan Simonson had to be loaned. Manchester United goes on top on October 9th. They lead for most of the month before, again, Liverpool comes back near the end of the month. You mentioned about Alan Ball's last match at the end of the month is against, against Everton, a 3-2 win. He said that he preferred to leave as it was difficult for him to maintain the levels of first division and preferred to leave now before he's shown the door. In other news, the Swansea manager, John Toshak, was banned from the bench until March 1983 and fined after his disrespect towards referee Howard Taylor in the Swansea-Watford match of the previous month. Incidentally, he could still be on the bench because he was still registered as a player. <laughs> so, so what does that mean then? Is he not, has he just got to act like a player on the bench and he can't act like a manager? I assume. <laughs> I don't, what, what, does he have to wear this kit? I, would, I don't know. I, I've never heard. I've I, never assume, heard I assume he can't give instructions. That's what our an assistant must has to give yeah. instructions. That's my. That would be my guess, but I don't know. He's probably going to. You know, I've never heard that. I, I, I find that absolutely extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> I've never. I mean, that's crackers. I mean, he could say he was giving instructions as a vocal substitute, couldn't he? Or something <laughs> like that. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's just uh, there. Oh, that, that, that's brilliant. He could just yeah. pass notes to someone else, couldn't he? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> that, that, that's up there with what was it, Mourinho getting snuck in with in the what the clothes yeah, basket was it in the Stamford Bridge when he'd been banned, banned from the ground or whatever it was, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think Graham um, soon as did something similar at Rangers, like uh. He, I think he, he was, I guess, caught giving instructions somehow when he wasn't supposed to. I remember some story like that around like 88 or so. Uh, that, oh, that's great. That's a great story. <sighs> do, do we know, sorry, by the way, do we know, um, Alan, so we can't let Alan Simonson's move to chat and go <laughs> unspoken about, can we? The one of the right up there in the top 10 most surprising. <laughs> Transfers in the history of English football, I would imagine, isn't it? 1977 European Football of the Year, replaced yeah. by Maradona, and ends up at, at the Valley playing in front. So, what would they be getting in 82, 5, 10,000, something like that? Absolute crackers. It's they clearly so, couldn't yeah. afford it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that was a mad story, that wasn't it? I don't think it did them much use in the end, though, did it? I, I think it probably crippled the club financially I'm guessing because I know in a few years they nearly went out of business but I think yeah, that, I think yeah. that's, one, that's probably one of the reasons it, but I yeah. think I by the new year yeah, he went back to that. Denmark to Vegle by the end of the month Liverpool is on top come the month of November we have the following transfers David Geddes from of Aston Villa is loaned to Luton Edge Harrod joins Norwich from Manchester City. Mark Azelwood joins Charlton from Luton. Mick Mills leaves Ipswich to join Southampton. Willie Donachy leaves Norwich to join Burnley. And Ivan Golak leaves Southampton to join Bournemouth. In, on November 6th, we have the famous Merseyside Derby at Goodenson Park with <laughs> Liverpool 
winning 5-0 and Ian Rush scoring four goals. Ian Rush last the previous season was really it was somewhat his breakout season, but I think it was this season that he would gain more of an international recognition. Yeah, absolutely. I think Rush was pretty much an unknown quantity in 81, 82. You forget that. I mean, he joined in, he joined in 80. So we've been, you know, we'd had all the 80, 81 season, not got in the team, and there was doubts about him. Came for the big fee. I think he may have gone to see Bob Paisley, and he got in for the League Cup final replay against West Ham at Villa Park, played very well. Played six or seven games at the end of the season, but didn't score. And I think Paisley had the word with him about being more ruthless. And he scored this. There's a mad fact about Ian Rush. His first league goal for Liverpool was in a 3-0 omen over Leeds in 1981 when John Lukic was the goal scorer. And his 200th league goal was in a 3-0 win against Leeds in 1996. And John Lukic was in oh, wow. goal. Still, I know Lukic had gone around, yeah, yeah. But Rush by, I mean, but the thing about Rush is when, and he, he was, he never, he, he, when he came to the team, around even around this time, he's a relatively young man, he looked pretty much to finish the article. You know, when you see players are coming for teams and they, they take two or three years to develop. I mean, Rush, I mean, he improved his heading and, and stuff like that, but he, he was, he became very, very uh, an absolute top class player very, very quickly in his, his development. And if he, I wonder if he was playing for Liverpool now, what his goal scoring record would be. I know he, he was absolutely top, top class rush. I mean, a great, a genuinely great goal scorer. I mean, if you were talking about him in British football, you'd put him right near the top, wouldn't you? You know, with Greaves and and such, and, and it's a toss up in terms of an absolute striker in British football. A, a British striker I've seen is a toss up between Rush. Don't know what you think, Steve. Rush and Shearer for me. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. I, I know my dad always talks about Jimmy Greaves. Obviously, it's just yeah. slightly before my time. Obviously, but um, yeah, Rush was what just I've seen, clinical. Yeah, yeah he's just he's you he gave him a sniff. Obviously, playing next to Kenny Dalglish as well. <laughs> Those two together were just unbelievable. Yeah, and, yeah. He was just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant striker. Really intelligent. I mean, I think he had Sunas behind him who could yeah thread three passes, but he was just a a brilliant, brilliant player who, who could left foot, right foot in the in the back of the net, and he was uh, he was just coming into you know, he reached his peak really, really early, but then maintained a level of yeah. It does show you, it's a bit strange. It, it, it does show you how football's changed, though. That they you know, bought this play. I, I guess Chester were Division Four, were they at the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you, you can't imagine Jurgen Klopp going to buy, I don't know, a Forest Green centre forward now and sort of saying he's going to step into a, <laughs> step into the centre forward shoes and bang him. Yeah, yeah. It's mad, it's mad, isn't it? How? Yeah. How recruitment has changed over the years, but yeah. by, by, by the law of averages, those players, <laughs> they must still yeah. exist, must they? They've not just disappeared. No, exactly. You know, is there, is there a certain amount of snobbery involved? I wonder how many rushes there are out there, perhaps, that <laughs> I've laid yeah. undiscovered, but he was just absolutely top class. I mean, this Liverpool team, 82-3, they were... He's obviously changed around in 81, 82, where they brought Whelan in, they brought Craig Johnston in, they brought Rush in, brought Mark Lawrence in. Yeah, Lawrenson, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so it was a change in team from on the end of the 70s, and they were all fully embedded by 82, 83. And they were sure to become domestically at least unstoppable, really. They were, they were just... You know, they'd seen it all before, and you know, the finely tuned machine. I think, um, soon as was answering his two peak years, Rush was, as you say, becoming top class. Kenny was still the best there is, and um, they were very much at this stage of the season, they'd had a bit of a ropey October, but they were just coming into their own, really. And 
there were some some seasons where Liverpool won titles between seventy three and ninety where they were just relatively untroubled. And this I suspect this was probably one of them. Yeah. yeah. They did keep signing other strikers though, didn't they? And for, for more money, I think it was David Hodgson this season and then Michael Robinson and Paul Michael Walsh. Robinson, and, yeah, and, yeah. And no one else quite did. well, obviously Rush and Doug Leash were pretty much impossible yeah, to did, replace them, but they it. did spend money, but the ones yeah, they spent yeah. money on didn't make as big an impact, funnily, did they? And did they yeah, um, I did mean, they sign Wait, Wayne Harrison? Was it was it was he the most yeah, impressive team? He was, yeah, yeah, he came from yeah. Oldham, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. Like you say, yeah, I did bought, buy them. Yeah. You bought Paul Walsh, didn't he, in 84? Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, Hodgson didn't. He never looked like a Liverpool class player, to be honest, but yeah. And that was a puzzling sign. And as indeed Michael Robinson was, if there ever was a. I mean, you know, we talk about John Toshak. I would imagine John Toshak would have bought Michael Robinson. <laughs> yeah. It was a puzzling sign, and wasn't he? Both and he got away with it, really, because they were big. I mean, what would Hodgson have been? Would he be in about 450, 500, something like that? Yeah, all of those half a million plus probably in in some cases, yeah. I I don't think they really got that till Aldridge um, came quite a bit later. Each season they seemed to spend quite a bit on a a new centre-forward and they just couldn't dislodge Rush, obviously. Yeah, they bought Walsh and then Wayne Harrison, um, I think, in 85. And as you say, so between 82 and 87... He probably bought three or four strikers that <laughs> didn't, for a number of reasons, didn't work for them, and Rush bailed them out, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was unstoppable. Actually. Interesting. By November, Liverpool has a four-point lead over Watford. Some other stories: the Ipswich manager, V. the press, he told Ron Atkinson that Alan Brazil is not for sale. So there's this is continuing lingering interest of Man United on Alan Brazil that will go on for the next couple of years. There's rumors that Alan Brazil actually is discontent at Ipswich, saying that he misses Arnold Muren's assists. At this point, yeah, Liverpool is starting to break away from the pack. Now we come to the month of December. And we have the following transfers. The Yugoslav star, Vladimir Petrovic, leaves Red Star to join Arsenal. We have to remind ourselves that Vladimir Petrovic was at this point one of the best Yugoslav players. But it seems like his transfer did go through with relative anonymity or certainly not the fanfare that you would have expected, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, I think... um... I've spoken to people who actually watched him at the time and said he was a, a great player, but probably just a, a bit ahead of his time, really. He was a bit frail, perhaps, to succeed in the sort of hustle and bustle of the top division. But there's so many people still speak highly of him at Arsenal. But, yeah, I think Terry Neal possibly realised he couldn't survive at the time in, you know, in, the, in the top flight. But he did bring some good memories to um, Arsenal fans, so... Yeah. Was was Neil Steve at, was Neil Shorter on borrowed time at Arsenal at this stage? I think because he'd been there uh, what five or six years, hadn't he? Yeah, and yeah. Well, well Arsenal. Competed, had he? Yeah, Arsenal reached two semi finals this year, but it kind of, it seems strange to say, but it kind of papered over the cracks slightly. It, um, and there, were, I think there were newspaper report rumours on on the day of the FA Cup semi final that he was pretty much on borrowed time. So it wasn't a massive surprise. I think it was December 83 that he went in the end, um, which is obviously next season. Yeah, because... Um, he, he, he failed to... He basically... He sold Brady, sold Stapleton, and just couldn't find solutions to... to you know, obviously, yeah. they were cheating players, but he couldn't replace those players. And uh, I, I, was, I was going to say, selling Frank Stapleton and buying Lee Chapman doesn't necessarily... Yeah. <laughs> really yeah. with confidence, does it really? You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I yeah. seen that he bought Woodcock, didn't he? Yeah, from Cologne. So I would imagine the Sunderland gone at this stage as well. The Sunderland, no, Sunderland was still at Arsenal. Sunderland, oh, it, Sunderland yeah, was, yeah. I think he went to it switch towards the end of the, the 80, year, 4, 83, yeah. 84 season. But yeah, no. Um, John Sperling wrote a brilliant book on Arsenal in the eighties, and you know he he says replacing Stapleton with Chapman is just one of the <laughs> worst episodes in Arsenal's history. To be honest, with you. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, he just, yeah, yeah, he was on on a time. It was just because I mean, I, it though you did two semi finals. I think you played yeah. United and both, didn't you? And you got oh, a, got you got a yeah. in the league yeah. cup, didn't you? Got hammered in the league yeah. cup, and um, yeah, basically just United overran us in the second half of the FA Cup semi final. So. Yeah. And yeah, you know, I, I think I think Neil Terry Neil admits in, in John Spurling's book he was basically coming to the end of his time and he was just exhausted towards the end of his yeah, time. I'm, I'm just I'm just thinking there. I just said that I, I dial on something left at this uh, juncture, and I just remembered that he scored the hat trick against Everton in the League he Cup. Did, in the, yeah, uh, yeah, I did make note of that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I've just blanked that from my memory. Yeah, exactly. You know? yeah, yeah. Other transfers, we have Jerry Daly on loan, leaving Coventry to join Leicester. Peter Reid joined Everton from Bolton. Steve Bull returned to Stoke from Torque from his loan. Frank Worthington left Leeds to join Sunderland. Mike Shannon left Bristol Rovers to join Norwich. And Mike Walsh left Norwich to join Burnley. Also, Justin Fashanu joined Nuts County around this time. We mentioned that he had been on loan to Southampton earlier in the season, but McMenemy could not raise the funds to buy him outright. Around the same time, Fashanu had also refused offers by Derby County and Manchester City. Liverpool is still at the top uh, this month of December. Aston Villa have a new president, Deadly Dog Ellis. <laughs> yeah, <he's in> charge. <laughs> uh, it, it was always a bit of a joke, wasn't it, amongst Aston Villa fans that I think Ellis left just before they won the league and the European Cup, and then he returned and they didn't win anything again. <laughs> yeah. there, was, there, there was a great, uh, I know we're going into a different season, but Doug Ellis always reminds me of a story. In I think it was '86 after he signed after he sacked Billy McNeil, and Atkinson was out for a job. He'd been sacked at Man United, and the Daily Express headline that headline Atkinson for Villa. And then I said this opening paragraph was like Ron Atkinson's only got to give this number, and he it gave like Ellis's phone number, <laughs> the phone to <laughs> Ellis on this number. And the Manchester United job is his. So as you can imagine, all morning, like, there's enough for me. The number was flooded with people phoning Doug Ellis or claiming to be Ron Atkinson that he wanted, wanted the job, you know. <laughs> that, was, that, that was a brilliant story, that. Speaking of Aston Villa, in this month of December, they will lose the Intercontinental Cup final to Peñarol in Tokyo. The first managerial casualty of the season was on December 6th when Brighton sacked Michael Bailey and James Melia became the manager on December 10th. So Jimmy Melia, well, we're talking about, isn't it? Comes to the fall later in the season, former Liverpool player. Uh, he'd been a Peter Bradley, or it was one of them, wasn't he? Being a, um, yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, he was very colourful, <laughs> colourful character. Typical, yeah. Um, was it Val, Val Lloyd, the model girlfriend? Or, I think he had, yeah, yeah, yeah. And let's face it, let's be honest. And I hope he's not listening. He was no old paint, was he, Jimmy Melia? To be he honest, yeah. <laughs> and other than being a football manager, I'm not sure what he had going for him. It's just had the, <laughs> a model, but yeah, he, he came in. I'm, I'm just thinking there, Mike Bailey could not have been a bright near long because Muller had been there what 18 months before and very short. Short sure, tenure. Yeah. They, yeah. they had an incessant season, didn't they, Brighton? <laughs> they did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which we'll come to. During the same month, Brian Clough inquired uh, about the Manchester City defender Kevin Bond, but uh, the club declined his advances. Also, there's news of West German midfielder Herbert Newman negotiating with Arsenal. But this did not go anywhere either, and he returned to his Italian club, Bologna. Liverpool extended lead to five points at this month ahead of Manchester United. By the start of the new year, by January 1st, on March 22, Liverpool has an eight-point lead on Manchester United and Nottingham Forest. They're starting to extend their lead in these early months of the year. Yeah, so it's, it's what we're saying there at the Christmas period. I think 
think Boxing Day 82 got some mad attendances, didn't he? Wasn't it? It was like, like the biggest attendances for about six years, wasn't it? On a on a given day, and Liverpool beat Man City 5 2 at, at Anfield, and it was Kenny. Yes. Kenny's like, it's changed enough. Kenny's like, he's only scored two attacks for Liverpool, you know, his entire career, both of them against Man City at Anfield. But yeah, they started to run run away with it by the turn of 80. AC trade, to be honest with you. In the new year, we have some other transfers. Liverpool's Howard Gale, who had been on loan at Newcastle, he joins Birmingham. Neville Southall, the Everton goalkeeper, he goes on loan to Port Vale, but he returns in April. Danny Wilson joins Nottingham Forest from Chesterfield. Leighton James joins Sunderland from Swansea. Mark Falco returned to Tottenham from his loan at Chelsea. And Alan Ball, we had mentioned he had left Southampton earlier to go to Hong Kong. He joins Bristol Rovers. Also, Ozzy Ardiles returns to England and Tottenham in the new year. By mid-January, Liverpool has a 10-point lead over Watford. And like you mentioned, are starting to build up a bigger and bigger lead. We have Aston Villa because of uh, winning the Champions Cup the previous season. They have a home and away matchups against Barcelona. The first one at New Camp, they lose 1-0. Maradona does not play in either of these matches as he's, I believe he's injured. So this were on January 19th and January 26th. So on January 26th, Aston Villa wins 3-0. And it's an ill-tempered match with three sending offs. In fact, Barcelona were fined because of their conduct. And their goalkeeper, Javier Uruticocha, was suspended four matches for mooning the Aston Villa crowd. So. This is this is this appears to be a decayed and same on this podcast. <laughs> <Yes. really. Yeah. laughs> That was, a, that was a that was a it's um I know some people say I don't like to see that in football but if you watch the second leg of that um Super Cup final it's it's hilarious. oh is, is it brutal is it Steve yeah yeah you go on YouTube it's just Barcelona are just just there to the the, the, the complete opposite of Barcelona in the modern era they're just hacking people left right and centre and I think Gordon Cowan's might have scored a, a penalty or off, off a rebound maybe yes and keep yeah. Yeah. Into the net and, yeah yeah and it's it's I think I think Alan Evans might have got suspended for the quarterfinal of the European Cup though, because he he was sent, sent off. off in the last minute of uh, yeah, extra time. Yeah. yeah, so that hit them hard against Juventus. They probably would have lost to Juventus anyway in the European yeah. Cup. But, yeah, but it's, 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 yeah. So go on YouTube, and watch it. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, it sounds <laughs> like another separate podcast, that doesn't it? Really. Yeah. I mean, they, they had that <laughs> um, reputation, didn't he? Kick Spurs off the pitch as well, Barcelona around this time. Yeah, yeah, like, yes. Yeah, yes. yes. Uh, around this time, Spanish football was known for its very physical play. In fact, that Barcelona were, had won the Cup Winners' Cup also by basically fouling their way against Standard Liège of Belgium the previous season. But that was generally characteristic of Spanish football of this time. Yeah, it, it, it's also with Matt Manson just changes in the season. 82, 83, this is the first time, because the FA Cup start, well, the third round starts in January. This is the first time my clubs are basically free to play for Sunday. Yeah. If they're being a, you know, like, so Evan and Liverpool had always played of a Saturday, it's drawn at home together, they both played at three o'clock. In fact, I think the last time you both kicked off at three o'clock of a Saturday, the FA Cup was 1981. Steve, if you remember at Goodison Park. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> it's just a random, you know, just to point that out yeah. when we ended your run. But the Sunday football starts is becoming quite regular around this time, certainly in the yeah. FA Cup. Because I think Tottenham... You know, sorry, sorry, Gavin. I think mean, didn't Tottenham ask Everton to move their game to the Sunday and Everton said no. And then it, was, it was the opposite. Everton asked, Everton asked Tottenham to move oh, okay. and, and Spurs yeah. said no. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but they, so Liverpool ended up playing on the Sunday. That was in the fifth round, but we played on the Sunday in the fourth round against Shrewsbury. So if you have a look around that season, there's this you can see the growth of growth of Sunday. Certainly in the FA Cup, Sunday Cup matches, 
and it was quite an incessant, incessant development, really, because you just didn't, you see the modern game changing, can you know how it is, how it yeah. is today, yeah. and you know, no longer be you have that massive. I mean, when you come to think of it, I mean, I know Manchester, but Manchester's slightly different because the grounds are far apart, and the you United know, in Salford, but. I mean, I would imagine an Arsenal Tottenham would have had their own game, Steve, wouldn't he, in the FA Cup and the beat. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying, trying to write 800,000 people yeah, back possibly. in the day, Milan now, North London. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Which is just unbelievable. I mean, we, you know how close Liverpool and Everton are, 800 <laughs> yeah. odd yards. In the 70s, on some days, to be 100,000 people within a half mile, yeah. half mile radius. But it was in 82, 83 that they started. Playing regularly, allowing clubs to move a game on the Sunday if it had to fix the clash in the city. Now we come to the month of February. As far as transfers, Gary Thompson joins West Bromwich Albert from Coventry, and the Dutchman Loic Ursen of Stoke leaves to join Harlem in Holland. On February 3rd, John Bond is sacked as Manchester City manager and replaced with John Benson. Shahan, um, sorry, I, I, I think didn't didn't he resign? I can't remember, but or either sack, way, yeah, I, re- either yeah, way, yeah, yeah, anyway, they they completely um <laughs> collapsed afterwards, didn't they? They um, I think they won. I wrote it down somewhere. They won three, drew two, and lost thirteen. No, lost twelve. They were tenth at the time that, that he left, mm-hmm. and then obviously we we'll probably come on to talk about Raddy and Tish, but um, come the end of the, the season. <laughs> That's the only reason I'm doing this podcast. It's the only yeah, reason yeah. I'm doing this podcast, by the way, so we can talk about the final day game at uh, Manchester City. Because the, let's face it, that's what this podcast is all building up to, isn't it? Really? <laughs> yeah. And and Gordon Skiff yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just yeah. That's that's yeah. It's what. But they've been on a bad run, City. If you have a look at the start of the season, they were near the top, but they've been yeah. on a, on a real bad run. And the thing, they obviously so Francis in in the summer. That, that, I think we've had this story last time out, didn't we? That Clough, because Clough had a major down on Italian football because of the, the events of scandal in '73 when he played derby, he refused to sell Francis to to Sampdoria in in '81. So City wow. just acted as a like you know a mutually agreed stop off point. Yeah, I'm just I'm just imagining the other subject we spoke last time did one of these season reviews is. The amount of Dutch players who have never heard of who've left English football every <laughs> month. There's players I can't, I can't even remember yeah. any of them. And the other <laughs> Dutch players leaving English football, it was like I've never heard of. And, <laughs> you know, they never did anything ever again. <laughs> no. During this month of February, Liverpool builds up a 15 point league and is running away with a title. In other news, Mark Proctor of Nottingham Forest. He refused a loan to Chelsea. He said, I have always played in Division One and I am from the Northeast and I don't like the people of the South. So. <laughs> I don't think um, maybe media yeah. training hadn't been invented back then. But. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just ruled out a move to about 50% of the football league. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I just wondered how, how, how we would like come to that conclusion. And, you know, <laughs> that's probably the more interesting part of the story, isn't it? Really, like uh-huh. had some despicable act being <laughs> yeah. formed on by on the pitch or whatever by Southern, yeah. you know. <laughs> and you had mentioned the Tottenham and Everton FA Cup match, so Everton eliminate Tottenham with a two-zero win, so. The double FA Cup winners were eliminated in this month, uh, and also Liverpool's hopes of uh, of winning the FA Cup were also dashed when they lose to Brighton with a team that contained Jimmy Case, former Liverpool star. Basically, at this point, Bob Paisley was to retire without ever winning the FA Cup. Yeah, just just worth asking. Jimmy Case scored the winner at Anfield, didn't he, for Brighton as well? Uh, um, yeah. Which was a bit yeah. mad, and, and it, it's it's funny, isn't it? That arguably, that you could you could make an argument that the two greatest English managers in the football league, Bob Pace and Brian Clough, never won the never won the yeah. FA Cup. Yeah, yeah. Th- this you is know, probably the big, 
biggest surprise this season, really, wasn't it? Brighton winning at Anfield. You know, yeah. No, yeah. No suggestion yeah. of a weakened team or not wanting to win it. Oh, no. Well, we, we, well Liverpool, as you think, by mid February, they were coasting the league. And mm. I remember because that was a Sunday game. We played Spurs on the Sunday at, at, at Goodison and won, won two in Hill. And I remember somebody asked Howard Kendall, the Everett manager, after the game. He said, dude, you fancy the next round? He said, oh, well, Brighton would be nice. And he was like, <laughs> just hoping against hope that he went at Anfield. And, and he did, and Liverpool missed the penalty as well. It's just yeah, funny how some things face as hardy that you would not have given Brighton a hope in hell's chance of getting the results at Anfield. I mean, and I think Liverpool, I can't remember, it was some mad fa- don't think lost at home in a cup game since... You know, domestic cup games since 1974 or something. Yeah, it's against Middlesbrough. Yeah. yeah, and it was like a massive, massive shock. And, you know, Brighton has a... I mean, that was the good thing, wasn't it, about them days? And Brighton had a really big following. And and because that was the other thing I meant, sorry, just to point out something as well. One of the things he found this season, when he played footy on the Sunday, had miles bigger attendances than the, yeah. on the Saturday. Games, you know, Saturday Sunday Cup games had massive attendances. I see that happened in '74. You know, when they had the power cuts and they played when they first started playing Sunday football. Full house at Anfield, forty-five thousand for the um, yeah. the Brighton game, and that was one of the other things that you you know people were learning about uh, when people want to watch football. Now, this does not concern the first division. Apparently, there were, uh, came across a lot of uh, headlines regarding this uh, Bradford City's illegal approach to Derby County to sign Roy McFarland as manager. Did that make a lot of news in England at the time? It, no, no. But I'll tell you what one did this season. There was the, there was the, wasn't it the, um, the John Robertson deal to Derby? That opened up um, a can of worms, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and the, the so-called illegal approach to yeah, which yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think of the timeline here. Taylor had gone to Derby, hadn't he? Yeah, and sort of poached. Yeah, John yeah. Robertson. From, right, that sort of rift yeah. between the two. Yeah, yeah. With Clough, sure. which Clough didn't really know about, and that that started sadly the rift between the yeah the yeah. two that sadly lasted till lasted till. Taylor died, and I think in was it 1990? Taylor yes. died, and yes. I just think that was really sad, you know. And, and I, I wonder if Clough was ever, Clough was ever the same as that. I think if you look at his managerial career, he was never the same manager without Taylor. He wasn't the same. No, he didn't have yeah. Leeds. Le- Leeds was a disaster for him, wasn't it? And yeah. Then I think they were just so good together that I think once Taylor left, I, he did build some good. Teams towards the end of the eighties, though at first they they were they got to cup semi finals and they won the league cup yeah. a couple of times. And obviously he had to contend with Liverpool at the end of the eighties, but yeah, it wasn't quite the same. Possibly could have reached the eighty four UEFA Cup final as well if, if they weren't slightly um, cheated out a bit. But we'll come on to that next time, I guess. Next, yeah, 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 and the left, yeah. No, <laughs> no, it's just it's just funny how that's how what was basically a straightforward transfer. Yeah. I'd, so much emotional baggage, you know, it yeah. broke up one of the great partnerships in any sport, never mind football. Yeah, it's a shame, as you say. It's, yeah, because I think Clough obviously massively regretted it once Taylor had died that they hadn't yeah. made up by that point. But... Yeah, I, I think I, you do wonder the whole, that whole damage on Clough's overall well being. Yeah, but like you say, you, if. if, if yeah, if Taylor died in 1990, that kind of does coincide, doesn't it, with the sort of start of the decline, maybe at first. But oh, they got to the 91 yeah, 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 but, could, yeah, but then, could, but then could, after that. Could, well made. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That clough after 90, as you say, they did choose the League Cup final. I think they won it in 90, did they? 89, 90. Yeah, they lost the Tottenham in 91 in the Cup final. But he's, can you remember he sat on the bench at the start of extra yeah. time? He didn't go out and talk to his players. And, I know he was always he, a bit. Left field, but. <laughs> he became increasingly erratic then, and facially you could see the, yeah, shall we say, the pressure mm. he was under. And you do wonder whether the passing of Taylor in ninety had, had a, yeah, a lot of a psychological effect on him, and that sense of loss sent yeah. him 
in a downward spiral, really, and maybe that's um, that's probably a good, good, you know, good, not a good thing. It's probably like a, you know, a good reason for why. Yeah. Why Why is decline happened? At the end of February, uh, Arsenal goalkeeper Pat Jennings becomes the first player to appear in 1,000 competitive matches in England. And Liverpool is still at the top with a hefty double-digit lead over Watford. We come to March. On March 1st, Peter Beersley leaves Manchester United to return to Vancouver Whitecaps after making a single appearance. Andy Ritchie joins Leeds from Brighton. Alan Brazil finally left Ipswich to join Tottenham. He said that Manchester United had taken too much time in making a decision. Joe Corrigan leaves Manchester City to join the Seattle Sounders. Mark Proctor of Nottingham Forest. He was loaned to Sunderland for a month. Paul Elliott joined Luton from Charlton. And Ivan Golak left Bournemouth to join Manchester City. And also, surprisingly, Laurie Cunningham is loaned by Real Madrid to Manchester United. Liverpool is still on top. In March, both Liverpool and Aston Villa are eliminated in the Champions Cup. Aston Villa lose to Juventus and Liverpool lose to Polish side Vizio Lodz. That was it. So that that's what well, we're talking about those games, aren't they? Because I think Villa was didn't he concede in the first minute, didn't he? Villa Park in the right. first like in Ross, they Ross lose score. Which, two one and three one both matches, yeah. Yeah. And Liverpool Liverpool lost in the I think they had a bit of a shocker. I think the plane skidded on the ice now and they landed in Poland and I think it shook up oh, some yeah. of the players. And I think they got beat 2 now over there. And I think Grobla, as Bruce did, come out for one and it went over his head. And <laughs> right. see this, it's, and then at Anfield, um, they got one back. And then, strange enough, probably the only time Graham Sheerness ever made a mistake in his Liverpool career, he, he slipped on the ball and ended up giving a penalty. And because they had the way goal, then have, they got beat 3 2, but they were, they were well in control. And so you had this, you had that mad run, hadn't you? Like it, it was significant, wasn't it? So this would be now the first year since '76. I think I might yeah. say there'd be no English club in a yeah. in the European Cup final. Both went off at the the early stages. To I mean, you can see Juventus beating Villa. Was that like? Oh, but I think Boniek scored. Was it bon, Boniek scored as well at Villa Park, didn't he? Yeah, um, and Rossi, Rossi as well, I think. Yeah, it was Rossi in the first, one of them was in the first minute. I'm not sure whether it was Rossi or Bonnier. Yeah. Um, it was a great game now. But you could feel have a lot of beats in Liverpool, you couldn't see happening, but it was just significant that that was I'm just I'm just trying to think of who else was in Europe that season. I think Spurs and United were probably Spurs went out. United I went think out. The UEFA Cup I, I I did make a note the UEFA Cup was a bit of a disaster because Arsenal went out to Sparta at Moscow. And Man United went out to Valencia. Roma beat Ipswich. Southampton, I think, lost to North Shopping. Yes, yeah, so it was a bit of a disaster. Really for, but obviously, uh, if, we, if, we, if we include um, Scottish clubs, then obviously we can talk about Aberdeen later in the um, Cup Winners' Cup final. Yeah. I don't want to sort of increase your pain there, Steve, but didn't Spartak give an Arsenal a pace than a hybrid, if I recall? Yeah, I'd, 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 like, I'd like to say you're breaking up, but I can hear you, sadly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, the 5-0 uh, five, five, five derby game got mentioned, you know, so <laughs> for balance, you know, mentioned uh, Arsenal conceding. Yeah, Arsenal lost 5-2 at home, yeah, and they um, ended up, most of the fans left in the ground ended up applauding Spartak off the um, pitch. It was yeah. a bit of a revisiting so, of the Corinthian spirit, yeah. Yeah, those, those are the days of the the crack Eastern European outfit, yeah. weren't they? Yeah, yeah. You know the how how days of European football with the teams in the eye, behind the Iron Curtain who turn up that you never heard of, never heard yeah. of the players, but more often they're not brilliant. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We're still in the month month of March. Arsenal advanced in the FA Cup to the semi-finals with the win over Aston Villa two zero. 
and Manchester United defeat Everton 1-0 to go to the semi-finals. Now, towards the end of the month, Liverpool clinched the League Cup for the third year running by defeating Manchester United 2-1. Alan Kennedy and Ronnie Williams score for Liverpool and Norman Whiteside scores for Manchester United. I guess he becomes the youngest ever goal scorer in a Wembley final in doing so. In a break from tradition, Graham Souness asked Bob Paisley to walk up and collect a trophy. As I believe the tradition is always for the captain to do it. In March, we have the famous Chester report by Sir Norman Chester. If yeah, this was, his, this was his second one. And he was still talking about a lot of the same problems and making recommendations that were ignored uh, <laughs> for, the, for the most part. The recommendations included the reduction of a first division from 22 to 20 teams the amalgamation of third and fourth division into four regional groups of 12. Home leagues keep all the gate receipts. Let him have that one, yeah. (laughs) Greater share of TV money for the home club. League Cup seating of first and second division clubs. Other than the final, the gate receipts of the League Cup to be shared equally. Similar division of gate money for FA Cup from the third to sixth rounds. FA to be asked to allow more than one paid club director on board. League constitution to change that there should be a fifth, uh, one fifth majority instead of three quarters to approve changes. I'm sorry, three fifth majority instead of three quarters uh, to approve changes. Transfer fees to be paid within three months and a league commission to research summer football, Sunday matches and Saturday afternoon kickoff times. That was it. I think the, it was the first report, 68, was it? The Chester report, was it? Yeah, that, that's Around right. Then. Yeah, yeah. just after yeah. the world. And as you say, yeah. he spoke about, I mean, he was about 78 when he did this, wasn't he? <laughs> no. Yeah. And I, I always think that this report is a real pivotal document in English football history because I think it would, dare I say, and we all know history repeats itself in football, that. It was around this time that there was first serious rumblings about a football league and a breakaway league yeah. of the so-called Big Five then and even with the Celtic and Rangers and some other clubs. And I think some of the concessions in this report were really to stop that happening. So we had two big ones. One, there was the redistribution of the TV money, wasn't it, from television? But the big one... And and this has really started off a whole chain of of changes to football finances and regulations that favour the big clubs. And and the one about redistributing about well, stop the redistribution of the home league uh, revenues to the away team. I think did they get twenty percent? Was it? I think. Um, yeah, and they've been slowly reduced. And yeah, yeah, yeah re- oh, reinforced the financial power of the big clubs and made them. So gave them all the power. And I think you can you can see a link from the 83 Chester report to like the project Big Picture in 2020, which is just effectively the same thing. They said the same things in 2020, what they said in 83. <laughs> Gale down first division, blah, 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 redistribution of money. And it, it's just the same principle. It's just been eaten away over years. But I don't think... I think the 83 Chester report, if that didn't exist or they would have totally thrown out all the recommendations, I think English football may have been slightly different in the the 20-odd years that followed because it just gave the big... Effectively, for the, probably for the first time in English football, concessions were given to big clubs to sort of keep them sweet, for want yeah. of a better phrase. Yeah, it's definitely a, a step towards what was to come. Yeah. For the month of April, we still have transfers. Uh, Neville Southall returns to Everton from his loan at Portwell. Mark Proctor returns to Nottingham Forest from his loan at Sunderland. Jimmy Nicole leaves Sunderland to join Toronto Blizzard. And Kieran O'Regan joins Brighton from Tremor Athletic. Dutchman Franz Tyson 
leaves Ipswich to join Vancouver Whitecaps. In the month of April, Liverpool builds a 16-point lead over Watford. Also, we come to April 9th. And that's significant because that's Liverpool's last win of the season. Liverpool would go on a disastrous run after more or less having uh, wrapped up the title. The following week, they tie with Coventry on a scoreless tie. And from that moment on, they would struggle. Although none of the other teams really would take advantage of Liverpool's problems. In this run, they will lose to Southampton 3-2. They will lose to Norwich the following week 2-0. Their form would, would suffer from then on. But they had won the title more or less. And they had not much to play for. They were out of Europe, out of FA Cup. More or less their season was over. Manchester United would reach the FA Cup final on April 16th after defeating Arsenal. While Brighton, who was headed for relegation, they would defeat Sheffield Wednesday. We come to news on uh, late May, where Mike Shannon is placed on a blacklist by the United Nations for taking part in a tournament in South Africa the previous summer. Uh, He stated that he felt no shame that at the time he was out of work and he had to put food on the table. We still have Liverpool still losing again. They will lose to Tottenham at the end of the month. They will lose to Nottingham Forest in early May, 1-0. They would come up with a tie with Aston Villa, 1-1. But they effectively win the title at the end of April. Despite their loss at Tottenham, the other teams couldn't catch up with them. Villa gave his pace his last game as a manager at Anfield when they were given given the, 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 the trophy. I know that because I was actually there. And, <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah, the game fella. And, yeah, it was a, a very most occasion, really, because Paisley's obviously been as a player and a, and a coach, so his, his, his association with the club went back probably, I think he came in 39 as a player, so it was 40-odd 40, 40 years as, a, as a, a player, coach and trainer and manager and you know we had but I can't remember how many titles he got at this stage is it six out in that six was it something like that and not, not only that but it's you're taking Liverpool up another level compared to Shankly Bill was a great manager but in terms of setting the club up but in terms of like being a proper footballing force playing especially great in football, Europe yeah yeah in Europe and stuff Paisley took them to a completely different level than what they were at on the Shankly. The following week on May 14th, at the end of the first division season, Watford defeated Liverpool uh, to finish runner up to Liverpool, 11 points behind. Watford was second, qualified for the UEFA Cup. Manchester United was third. Tottenham was fourth. And Nottingham Forest was fifth. And Aston Villa sixth. So Tottenham, Nottingham Forest, and Aston Villa qualified for the UEFA Cup. Could we possibly talk about the the Man City Luton game. Oh, oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff, of course. <laughs> yeah, right um, <laughs> that's yeah, that's why Gary's here. Um, yeah, yeah. Obviously, was it Radian Tish? But I don't know. It was the last ten minutes. He scored that famous yes. goal at Main Road. Yeah. Yes. The, and then David Pleat ran on, obviously, in his brown suit. <laughs> uh, it was it was just incredible drama. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the key the key things about that game was the week before City played a similar game at Brighton, hadn't he? Yeah, where the winner of that kept themselves alive for the final day, and the other the other team got relegated. And I think yeah. Kevin Neves scored for, for, for City, and they thought at that stage that that's that's kept them up. Yeah. You've only got to you know draw. I mean, and Luton had been on a terrible terrible run. They had a decent season. I mean, because that's yeah, I think that's the funny thing how things work out, isn't it, in football that. Luton had been champions of the second division, hadn't he? And Watford had come second. Yet when they yeah. come up to the first division, what with Watford for second and Luton were right near the bottom. <laughs> yeah. It's absolutely mad when he seemed to have been the second division. Luton were clearly a better, better team. 
Yeah, but when he came up, Watford, I think because of the style of play, what we were talking about, were far more yeah. effective. And so, yeah, he comes to this. I mean, Butter, I mean, imagine that on live television now. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was just be, it'd just be absolutely incredible, wouldn't it, really? Incredible drama. And as you, as you say, it was, it was just an unbelievable ending, wasn't it, really? Because at that stage, was Alex Williams had replaced Corrigan, hadn't he? Because Corrigan gone. Yeah. And I can't remember, Steve, what was the crossover come over from the right and yeah, from the right hand side, and Williams sort of came out and kind of yeah. punched it towards the edge of the box. And it, it seemed to go through about five different players, but it, it ended up, I think it might have flipped off Ray Ransom or something. I can't remember. But, and um and obviously John Motson went mad and <laughs> David Blee went mad eventually. But, yeah, and I think Brian Orton was, was Brian yeah. Orton still playing that. Yeah. And I think Antish, I mean, it's mad, isn't it, that I'd sadly no longer with us, is the thing, isn't he? Yeah. Like, so he, he managed, he did he manage Real Madrid, Atletico, he managed... And Barcelona. He managed yeah, all the big three. Yeah, it, and it's just absolutely crazy when you see that game, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The score yeah, of this yeah. game's got managed. Yeah. And it, but it, it's all... Apart from the drama of Antiti's goal, it then becomes all about pleat. Yeah. Or most more specific pleat suit and suit, suit combination, <laughs> doesn't it really? It's yeah. just it's like early eighties beige suit and loafers and just I mean yeah. he, he, he's like a some evangelical <laughs> speaker, isn't he? When he's, he's waving his hands in the air and his arms are going all over the place as he runs across the pitch, and it was just I mean, I think when you obviously we have match of the day in this country, I think that would be up in the top ten match of the day moments of all time, wouldn't it have to be? Oh, I think so, yeah. Yeah. It's the most memorable yeah, image yeah. of this season, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I but in, in match of the day history for me, it's it, it's up there with Ronnie Radford's goal, isn't it? And yeah, and so on as 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 one of the memorable moments. And it was just it was just unbelievable sport and drama and yeah it was oh, it's just it'd be places <laughs> now wouldn't it really Plato I like it a hell I like a lot a lot of time for he was uh, a good manager it was just incredible wasn't it really what what, a, what an end to the league season <laughs> fantastic and then we get to the the cup finals don't we yeah. yeah yeah so Manchester City along with Swansea and Brighton were relegated and Queen's Park Rangers Wolves and Leicester were promoted as far as the FA Cup final, on May 21st, you have the first matchup between Man- Manchester United and Brighton that ended in a 2-2 tie. Gordon Smith had given Brighton the lead in the 14th minute. Uh, then the second half, Frank Stapleton and Ray Wilkins seemingly gave Manchester United the winning goals until a few minutes before the end when Gary Andrew Stevens scored a tying goal. So it had to go to a replay. And five days later, on May 26, Manchester United just overpowered the already relegated Brighton and won 4-0. Brian Robson scored twice. Norman Whiteside scored again in a final at Wembley. And Arnold Muren scored with a penalty kick. And yeah, obviously, um, Brian, Brian obviously missed a big opportunity in the first match in the last minute with Gordon Smith, but and then Steve Foster returned, didn't he, for the <laughs> replay because he'd been booked and suspended for the final. But I think in the game he got booked, he tried to get sent off so it, he would just serve. A, I think it was a one match ban or something. So, but he couldn't get himself sent off, so he, he missed the, FA, the first FA Cup final. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I I don't know what your recollection. I mean, mine that game was that it's a really good game. Yeah, it uh, was. The first game. Yeah. Really good game. I mean, it was a great goal by Wilkins, who didn't score yeah. many. I think when you got 2 1, you're thinking that, you know, United are going to uh, vault shit. But then Gary Stevens was outstanding, wasn't he, for Brighton that day? And that yeah. got him his move to, to Tottenham. And the well deserved equaliser. And then you get that, you know, the. Memorable cup moment, wasn't it? Where they break away yeah. and it's a Robinson squared it, was it Steve to Smith? Is what he's yeah, six yards, seven yards out? 
Yeah, Gordon Smith always um, said he, he was surprised that um, Michael Robertson passed it to him, but because he, he yeah, 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 yeah. Robertson never passed, but yeah, and then um, Gary Bailey smothered it. But he got a course under his feet. I think he, you are right because he sort of. I don't think he's expecting because the ball gets close under his feet, doesn't it? Does. He? And he, he doesn't really. He can't take a proper shot. By the no. time he sort of got the ball out, Bailey's now at the angle, and, and yeah, it was the fa- it was it was it Peter Jones on. Commentating yeah. on the age out. Yeah, see that Smith must score. <laughs> yeah. And oh and then it's, it just goes completely flat then, doesn't it? Oh, it does. It does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. But more, as as is what usually the case in major finals, if there's an underdog in the first game who survives to get a chance in the second game. And yeah, this this is one of them. And for the second consecutive team, a team that lost the league cup second consecutive year. A team that had lost the League Cup final, so Liverpool returned to the Cup final in May and, and won. Happily yeah. for, for me personally, that carried on until 1984. <laughs> oh, yeah. And yeah, it was it was a good game though, the first game. It was a proper yeah. Brighton, Brighton plays plays really well. And it was just, it would be in the last relegated team to play. Anybody know before Brighton in 83? Did was it, oh, don't know, that's a good question. Uh, anybody trying to think? There's been that, one since that. We're, we're going to be one. Hall. Yeah, we're going to hold yeah. one of those teams. Yeah. Mid- Mid- yeah. Middlesbrough, reached, Middlesbrough reached the final in 97 and got relegated, didn't they? But, oh, but yeah. I don't know, yeah. I don't know before. I don't know before. But... I was just trying to think before Brighton, whether anybody had been. I'll tell you, I, I know what the answer is. I know exactly what the answer is. Less than in 69. Ah, yeah. Sunderland in 73, they were a second division team, right? Second division, but Leicester had been relegated in 69 oh, yeah. when he played City. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. But it was it was a good game, and it was Atkinson's first trophies man United manager. And I think it's funny, isn't it? There was a feeling then that like they kick on from that, like Ferguson did in 90 on the back of the FA Cup win against against Palace, but United, though, they were a good cup team. They, they never did, did they, really? They... Yeah, being consistent. Yeah. Inconsistent in the league, still a good cup team, but they, they never kicked on in the, in the way that people were expecting after the, the 83 yeah. Cup triumph. I think that was one of those when we've spoken about, you know, how big the FA Cup was and that year having two particularly flamboyant managers so <laughs> I think when we uh, think of David Pleats who I think Ron Atkinson and uh, Jimmy Melia were also competing for uh, <laughs> yeah. the style yeah. stakes for that one but, but, both both scousers with uh, their own style I mean I think Jimmy had his disco white disco shoes didn't he <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, if you remember yeah yeah, and I always remember Brighton turning, um, arriving in a helicopter, didn't they? And they landed near Wembley. Then. So that was a bit weird. All right, that, that's even that's even better. But yeah. I, I like I, Ron's. I'm quite fond of Ron. Yeah, you know, I Ron think he's, was, a, yeah. he's a proper. I think he, he people think he's a bit. You know, <laughs> it's the same neck as East in the game for flamboyant and stuff. But underneath that, he's a he was a very good manager who understood the game a lot more than what people thought and. Yeah, you know, and, and his teams always play good football, and I have a lot of t- I have a lot of time for Ron, uh, and he, he fully deserved that because he's done great at West Brom, hadn't he? he? Had a decent couple of seasons with United, and I think I think he deserved that cup triumph. Um, to be fair, and um, yeah, well, well done. It was a good, it was a good game, and Brighton Brighton disappeared off the edge of a cliff, then, didn't he? Really, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a good team at Sheffield Wednesday later on Atkinson as well, and Villa. Yeah, and Villa. One, one yeah, season Villa, in the yeah. league. Yeah, uh, I, I think. So. I think is he is he is he still the only manager to win trophy major trophies with three different clubs? Yeah, he might be. I think I think he might be. Yeah, yeah, consistently good teams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Kenny Douglas won the Football Writers and the PFA Player of the Year awards that year, and Ian Rush. Completed a Liverpool clean sweep by winning the PFA Young Player of the Year. The top scorer that season was Luther Blissett of Watford with 27 goals, who would then join AC Milan for the following season. But that is another story. Ian Rush, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, Ian Rush scored 24 goals and John Dean of Norwich scored 20 goals. I was able to find out some of the club players of the season. Some clubs I was not able to, and some clubs did not even have this award at the time. But just to give an indication of who the players of the season were, for Arsenal, it was Tony Woodcock. For Birmingham, it was Tony Coton. For Brighton, it was Gary Andrew Stevens. For Coventry, it was Gary Gillespie. For Ipswich, it was Paul Mariner. For Manchester City, it was Kevin Bond. For Norwich, it was Dave Watson. For Nottingham Forest, it was Steve Hodge. For Nuts County, it was Radochko Avramovich. For Southampton, it was Mark Wright. For Stoke, it was Mickey Thomas. For Sunderland, it was Ian Atkins. And for West Ham, it was Alvin Martin. I, th- I was just thinking this is quite a few funny ones there. There's at least three Liverpool centre-halves there at some stage, isn't there? Or yeah. Gillespie, right? Well, I know Dave Watson was a Liverpool centre-half, not for the first team. Yeah, Martin um, was, yeah. Gillespie, Gillespie went to Liverpool, didn't he, in 80, three. 83. Right, took a few years. Yeah, some incest. And didn't realise Tony Woodcock would have been your player of the year. Stephen, I don't remember him having that great a season. Well, I think he was he was our top scorer, so it probably probably wasn't much to choose from that season. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe Paul Davis. I don't know, it might be slightly before he started cracking it in the first team. But um, Stuart Robson was just emerging. But yeah, I think, I think Tony Woodcock... I, I remember... When, Many years ago, when I was a junior gunner, he was the the, the person um, who I am requested an autograph from. So, um, for, for my junior, so yeah, he was a bit of a bit of a hero of mine when I was younger. But. Interesting, Tony Coulton's name mentioned at Birmingham. For this, uh, the only reason I mentioned it, that this is probably the peak Birmingham six years, isn't it? Really, eighty three to eighty four, probably <laughs> the most. Shall we say the most troublesome and combative? <laughs> Uh, yeah. A group of players that's ever inhabited the, the a single <laughs> English dressing room would be it'd be Mark Dennis Harford, wouldn't it? Was it Mark Kennedy there then? No, 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 but, I mean, I tell you what, we, you spoke about Paul Davis. We've spoken about Paul Davis being one of the best uncapped players. I think Tony Cole will be well up there, won't he, for Bond being yeah. one of the best, un- certainly the best uncapped English keeper. Oh, definitely. Yeah, superb yeah. keeper, Colton, just at the start of his career. But, yeah, uh, superb keeper. There's, there's always that story, isn't it? Isn't it? Wasn't he at <laughs> Man City and he was going to win and Graham Taylor wanted to cap him for England and... Wasn't it when uh, Peter Swales was chair of the International Committee and it meant that City had to pay? Yeah. Was it was a whatever they bought from had to pay money. It's because you captain. I think they reckon that uh, Swales had the quiet word, didn't they, with Taylor and said, like, don't, don't play if you've got to pay money for City. <laughs> yeah. I read that in Tony Cohn's book, actually. Yeah, it's quite. Is it? Yeah, quite, yeah. Quite, not, not amusing for Tony Cohn, but quite amusing for everyone else, I think. Mean. Yeah, yeah, uh, that was a uh, that was a great story. That, but yeah, tremendous keeper. Very lucky to not to be cut for England. As far as the season, I guess business as usual with Liverpool winning, who were going to have an even better season the following season. The surprise package was obviously Watford, and uh, the emergence of John Barnes, Luther Blissett in his bright, I guess moment where he was also capped that season. In fact, he scored a hat trick against Luxembourg earlier in the season, I believe, right? If he's one of his first... Yeah, nine, yeah, nine nil nine against zero. Luxembourg. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> not, not hard, not hard that, to be fair. Um, <laughs> just, just to say before, Bob Downs and Steve mentioned before, we were obliged to talk about Aberdeen, aren't we? Yeah, I was sure. going to mention Aberdeen because um, I think they beat Bayern Munich in the quarterfinal round, which in the final of the European Cup in the Cup with some achievement. And that's the last final that Real Madrid has lost until today. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's amazing when you think Aberdeen, what well, Alex Ferguson did at Aberdeen is remarkable. And I think Dundee United won the league in Scotland that year. Yes, as well. yes. I was just going to say how competitive Scottish football was at this time, probably in contrast to what we've been talking about <laughs> Liverpool's. Um, yeah. 
title win that, yeah, that went yeah. that went right to the wire the one point between the top three like I say Dundee United winning it for the first time Aberdeen winning European trophies that was that was probably about the peak of competition in in Scotland it's obviously not been repeated um since then but you you know you had real competition there yeah I mean if you think about it I mean, they were called the new firm, weren't they, if I remember right? They've done the United and uh, Aberdeen. I think Aberdeen reached the semi-finals at the fol- following year. Yes, yes. And, so did Dundee United also. Dundee United. Yeah, yeah. Dundee United. Yeah. Well, there's, there's always been stories about the Roma game, hasn't there, in 80 years? Oh, right, right, right. 80, yeah. 80, 84. Yeah. And then Dundee United reached the way for Cup final in 80, 87. Right. Yeah. Um, so, success at home and abroad. But I think... There is a discussion to be had whether Ferguson's best work as a manager was done at Aberdeen rather than Man United in some respects. But that yeah. was a that was a yeah. great team that that Aberdeen. You can they. I mean, no Real Madrid weren't Real Madrid as we know in the fifties and when the, the Glasgow was here, but they were still a decent team. Yeah. And my main memory was that like at that game was like Aberdeen just attacked for the the entire match and they were well worth. The victory. The, the win. I always remember Eric Black was a really good. He was a promising striker, wasn't he, Eric Black? And he, I think yeah. he scored. I remember some fakes and saying that Eric Black was like Ryan Giggs, maybe not as precocious, but Giggs, uh, Fergus, and learnt a lot about how to handle Ryan Giggs because of the mistakes he'd made managing oh, okay. Eric Black. Um, in terms of like his game time and Black had picked up a few injuries and plays and when he probably shouldn't have done and stuff like that in terms of you know his general management and, and Black was a really he was a tremendous striker he scored and then uh, he got the winner with was it John Hewitt was it the John yeah, Hewitt yeah. yeah 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 well that was a great win that I mean Aberdeen yeah. and the Orkid Sophia just yeah. you know with all due respect yeah uh, <laughs> I mean and it, it, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Well, but this is a separate podcast, isn't it? But it makes you wonder why Ferguson in 83. Arsenal must have 83-4 the stories, wasn't it? Now, if he did that now, Ferguson, he wouldn't be managing the team, would he? For another three and a half years. No. No. No, no. You know, Not only him, really. but all the players would have probably been snapped up by English clubs. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't think any of them, but Strachan played, didn't he? I would imagine. Strachan, yeah. 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 I'm not sure the rest of the team was a weir. The, the, who was the, the, the left, left winger? Um, uh, Leighton, Miller and McLeish. Uh, yeah. Simpson. Yeah, weir. Um, McMaster played as in McGee. AC3. Mark McGee, yeah. I think, yeah. So, yeah, McGee. McGee. McGee he joined so, Hamburg a year later, yeah. Yeah, but so, well, if you think about it, they'd, they'd all be snapped up now, probably, wouldn't they? Really? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I'm reminded of the story about like how football changes that. Aberdeen, I can't remember who was trying to, but they signed Willie Miller, like part of the deal was that he'd have a £10 a week contract in the local newspaper to write like, a column, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just like <laughs> football for you, you know. Liverpool just ran away with it, really. It was, you know, if Sky were covering that title race, even they wouldn't have been able to make anything dramatic out of that. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, It'd all be about the final day, wouldn't it? It would have been about Luton, yeah. Would, the final yeah, yeah. day would not have been a, if you look at the fixtures, there'd yeah. be no single fixture there that would be. <laughs> that, that's it. Have attractions to the TV cameras apart from Man City, Man City yeah. Luton, yeah, and that will give you a, a season's worth of uh, drama in the space of ninety minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, with that, once again, we would like to thank Mr. Buckland and Mr. Pai for their participation in this series. As always, feel free to leave questions and comments. You may contact me on my blog or on Facebook under Soccer Nostalgia. On Twitter, I'm at SP1873. Mr. Paul Whittle can be contacted on his blog, The 1888 Letter, and on Twitter, he's at 1888 Letter. 
You may also follow the podcast on Spotify and now on Google, Apple, and Stitcher, all under Soccer No Soccer Talk Podcast. Please leave a review, rate, and subscribe if you like the podcast. And Mr. Buckland and Mr. Pai's uh, contact info on Twitter and Mr. Pai's blog uh, are also listed on the blog and our podcast listings. So once again, thank you, gentlemen, and looking forward to the next season, 1983-84. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks both. Cheers. All right, mate.